Welcome to A Survivor's Guide to Hell, where we challenge our listeners to take a closer look at the bright side of things. Negative news media can hurt your mind. Studies suggest that consuming negative media has a way of amping up the stress hormones in your brain, which can make you feel fatigued, depressed, anxious, and sleepless. Bad news is more likely to make front page headlines than good news. But at Survivor's Guide to Hell, we take a different approach. Each week, we select a difficult topic, then use that theme to help you laugh, help you find a bright side, or even change your perspective for the better. We want to improve your mood, your character, and your mental health with a healthy dose of silver linings. We are so happy you found us. Today, our unpleasant topic is... Getting burned. My birthday was about a month ago, and I was especially excited. For the first time in our marriage, Jerry and I had planned a camping trip. Our kids were finally old enough to leave at home with our daughter as the babysitter. My plan was to take the toddlers on their morning walk, return to the house, then spend the afternoon packing for the trip. The sky was beautiful as the boys slid into their stroller seats and quickly became mesmerized with the passing scenery. The atmosphere was crisp enough to discern the separate pine trees on the mountain face and chilled enough to fill our lungs with a cool drink of air. By the time we'd walked 20 minutes down the road, however, the sky wasn't so clean. The air took on a reddish hue and it began to feel dry in my throat. By the time I'd returned home, some of the nearby mountains were being consumed by a rosy, cough-inducing haze. I got the kids inside and did a little research. Evidently, one of our nearby mountains had caught fire, but most of the smoke was a little gift we were inheriting from California's inferno. By dinner time, even the mountain a mile up the road had disappeared in the smog. It felt like the world was on fire. My birthday camping trip was a no-go. There were Californian families having a much worse day than me, evacuating their homes and trading their belongings for their lives. On our Utah mountain and the mountains in California, swaths of fire were driving out wildlife and killing the weak, leaving abysmal patches of soot and charred carcasses as it went. Only one word felt appropriate to sum up the day. Burn. Whether it's literal or metaphorical, getting burned hurts. It doesn't matter if some sizzling oil from your baking project has sprayed across your face or you've just evacuated your home in the wake of a fire, or someone dropped a particularly dirty insult over your clean name. Getting burned is just about as fun as it sounds. Today, we've got some balm for your blisters. Even getting scorched has a bright side. In this episode, we'll discuss three epic silver linings to wildfires and connect them with three modern life parallels of folks recovering better than ever from their metaphorical burns. Get your burn cream and your aloe vera. We're diving into the fire. Part one, when life needs fire to keep on living. When we think of deforestation, we might think of smoke, smoldering fauna, and of course, fire. When we think of reforestation, we might think seeds, rain, and a lot of the color green. Deforestation and reforestation might happen one after the other, but they don't really go together. Not in our heads, anyway. But what if there was a way that wildfire was actually good for trees? What if a fire could plant a forest? The answer lies in the cones of lodgepole pine and jack pines. While most trees have seasons where their fruit drops, their pine cones open, and their seeds fill the soil, the lodgepole and jack pine trees are required to be more patient. Their cones are sealed with a resin, trapping the seeds of their progeny inside. Only one event can loosen the resin, open the cones, and reseed the pine. Fire. Without the flame that scorches the parent trees, the regrowth process could never begin for newer saplings. 
There are other trees like eucalyptus and banksia that have similar properties that allow them to start fresh in the midst of extreme heat and destruction. But trees don't have a monopoly on starting fresh in tumultuous times. Sometimes, when it comes to flourishing in the aftermath of disaster, it's human beings that take the cake. Often the flame that scorches a person and their family is the flame of injury and disease. Want to feel like an emotional wildfire has scorched over your spirit? Try sipping chemotherapy for a few weeks. One of the most notorious injuries and illnesses affect the brain. Many have heard, and many more could guess, that if someone experiences traumatic brain injury or loses a part of their brain because of surgery, their personality has a way of taking a tip for the worse. You may recall the story of Phineas Gage, who was helping build a railroad in 1848 when an explosion sent a steel bar into one end of the man's skull and out the other. His miraculous survival was accompanied by a stark change in personality, turning Phineas from a popular man to an irreverent, impulsive, disrespectful reject. Perhaps Phineas' story is part of the reason we caution our kids to wear helmets when they mount their bikes, or why we might buckle up before driving. Who wants to turn into an impulsive, disgusting jerk? because they fail to keep projectiles from blasting their cranium. However, just like a fire may reseed a tree at the same time it's dismantling a forest, a brain injury may just plant a new opportunity for a person to change stubborn, negative parts of their personality for the better. Meet Anthony. We don't know his actual name, but we know his jarring story. Anthony was a college-educated Baptist minister but there was something very dark swirling behind the Christian teachings in his mind. There were voices. Voices that told Anthony that he needed to die. The academic article that describes Anthony's condition is unclear about how the police were notified of his suicidal intentions. We do know that after they arrived, something went terribly wrong. This Baptist minister had a gun. Perhaps he was carrying it to assist him in the task the voices had given him, but when the police arrived, he turned the firearm on them. Shooting erupted on both sides. The police returned Anthony's fire, placing several bullets inside the man. Finally, one traced a path through the air and into Anthony's brain. Each police officer survived, and surprisingly enough, so did Anthony. He recovered with a frontotemporal brain injury and a large craniotomy defect which is medical jargon for, his brain had a lot of holes in it. If a brain injury could turn an amiable favorite like Phineas Gage into a mean-hearted, ill-tempered man, where would it take this imprisoned, schizophrenic, would-be killer? His case report gives us the answer. The patient recovered, but was left with a major personality change, characterized by persistent feelings of mirth and happiness. He had previously suffered from frequent depression and suicidal ideation, which resolved after his head injury, such that he never required further treatment or intervention. He now described himself as a blabtist, not a baptist, because he likes to blab. On examination, he was observed to be unconcerned, frequently jesting, punning, or making light-hearted teasing comments to others, and generally not taking his situation seriously. His jokes were silly and puerile. For example, he would often ask, Do you want to hear a dirty joke? After a brief pause, he would announce the punchline. A white horse fell in the mud, and burst out laughing. When asked, he was readily able to suppress his joking and merriment for prolonged periods without signs of anxiety or distress. He was alert and mostly cooperative with good social reciprocity, eye contact, and turn-taking. Anthony's report noted significant memory impairment after the injury, but excellent performance on joke comprehension. A person doesn't have to hit an emotional or psychological rock bottom to be reborn after brain injury. A man reported as patient 2410 was described by himself and his wife as short-tempered and mopey. After his brain injury, however, he was more passive and easygoing. 
after patient 3534, a 70-year-old woman, inherited brain damage upon the removal of a tumor. Her husband described her as irritable, grumpy, and stern. But after 58 years of knowing her, he explained that post-surgery, she was happier, more outgoing, and more talkative than ever before. One study found that nearly 23% of its research participants experienced positive personality changes after their brain damage. Of course, we don't advise self-induced brain damage if you're ill at ease with your personality. Like poor Phineas Gage, most of these injuries still leave their victims a little worse for wear. However, even with damage as severe as Phineas's, the man was still able to recover much of his previous functioning and make a successful return to society. And for people like Anthony and patients 2410 and 3534, an injury that could have burnt them to the ground ended up paving the way for newer positive growth. Though their injuries were likely accompanied by some unwelcome side effects, obstacles like severe depression, suicidal ideation, ill tempers, and unfriendly demeanors in general had gone up in smoke. In their absence, joke telling, mirth, and an easygoing nature were spreading new roots. Just like the cone of a jack pine in the intense heat of a wildfire, it sometimes takes destruction of epic proportions to unlock a new generation of potential in the human mind. Part 2 Birds with Flames in Their Beaks. Wayward fireworks, lightning strikes, a carelessly discarded cigarette, or a campfire that never quite went out. For anyone who lives in an area where wildfires are common, these are all well-known causes. However, sunken in the ancient lore of Australian aboriginals is a much less likely theory. Birds. The aboriginals told stories of creatures they called firehawks that would select a burning piece of material, like a stick still smoldering on one end and carry the flame to an untouched area of dry grass and set the place freshly ablaze. Of course, many aboriginal people also believe in an evil water spirit named Bunyip that resembles a giant starfish, so the existence of a firehawk remained mere legend to those outside of the aboriginal circles. Then, an autobiography by W. Philip Roberts was published in 1964. I have seen a hawk pick up a smoldering stick in its claws and drop it in a fresh patch of grass half a mile away, then wait with its mates for the mad exodus of scorched and frightened rodents and reptiles. When an Australian ornithologist upturned this passage, it captured his attention. He and others began searching for first-hand accounts of this firehawk. Eventually, lucky researchers began to see the phenomenon themselves. As the birds, known as black kites, whistling kites, and brown falcons in the scientific world, drove flames across dry savanna grass, they also drove a frenzy of fleeing prey into concentrated masses. For these birds, the hunting is easy when the world is on fire, and these natural disasters empower them to take care of themselves, their fellow birds, and their young. And here we thought that human beings were the only creatures to start fires on purpose. Of course, these feathered arsonists are sacrificing a significant chunk of their habitat every time they catch it on fire. But the reward is more valuable than what was lost. This principle, the idea of great sacrifice for even greater reward, is not new to human beings. We sacrifice our time and effort in exchange for money. We sacrifice our comfort, and occasionally our sanity, to provide our kids with the best life we can. We may sacrifice our health on behalf of an addictive lifestyle, or sacrifice an addictive lifestyle on behalf of our health. Every day, we allow something we value to burn on behalf of something we value even more. Of course, there are times when we're not very good at this whole sacrifice thing, Perhaps this is why most diets don't last. Most folks don't have as much savings as they'd like, and many bucket list items remain eternally unchecked. So when we hear a story of someone making a near impossible sacrifice in exchange for an epic reward, we often find ourselves agape with admiration. One such story belongs to Salvo de Equisto. 
Salvo was born shortly before the Second World War, into a heavily impoverished part of Italy. When he was 14, he left the one-room apartment that housed his parents, his grandparents, and his seven siblings in order to join the Italian Armed Forces. As Salvo neared his 23rd birthday, he was posted outside a small village just north of Rome. The Second World War was in full swing, so when he saw a group of SS soldiers approaching, there was little surprise. Salvo greeted their officer, who responded by forcibly striking Salvo. The officer explained that his men had been inspecting a nearby munitions supply when there was an explosion, killing two of his men and leaving one injured. The SS man was convinced that the event was a product of sabotage and demanded that Salvo and his men find the culprits. Salvo investigated the situation, but could only conclude that the explosion was an accident. The Germans, however, were not satisfied with this conclusion. They wanted reprisal and they would not stop until blood was spilt. The SS searched the village, arresting 22 local residents and corralling them at the feet of an ancient watchtower. Again, the Germans demanded that Salvo identify the culprits. Again, Salvo insisted the event was an accident. He was ridiculed and beaten when suddenly shovels were distributed among the 22 civilian prisoners. They were instructed to dig a mass grave it would be needed once the Germans were through executing them. Unless, of course, Salvo could produce the guilty party. The civilians dug. At least one of the prisoners laboring at his own grave was a teenager. Salvo watched in dismay as the hole at the foot of the weathered, stony tower grew. Perhaps he was thinking of the prisoners' families as their grave neared the requisite size. Perhaps he was holding his breath, hoping it was a bluff. However, as the haunting pit reached completion, it seemed that the Germans sincerely planned to execute every last civilian. After having watched those he was meant to protect dig their own graves, Salvo's resolve was fixed. He would free them at any cost. The 22-year-old boy pretended to confess. He told the SS that it was him, and him alone, that was responsible for the explosion. The Germans believed they'd broken Salvo as they bound his hands behind his back and placed him in front of a firing squad. In reality, they'd done the opposite. The man at the tips of their rifles was as determined, virtuous, and strong as he'd ever been. Like a firehawk, Salvo had been carrying a flaming stick. With his confession, he'd thrown the hungry flames over his chances of survival. Salvo knew he'd burn. He also knew that in the wake of the flames that would consume him, 22 innocent men would escape with nothing but the singe of his burnt up future. Like prey animals had outrun a wildfire. Only one of the civilians Salvo had freed, the teenage boy, stayed to watch his newfound savior executed. It was just before dusk. In the years following his death, Salvo de Aquisto was not forgotten. He has been honored on postage stamps on television as a candidate for beautification and as three separate monuments in or near Italy. I'm positive that what Salvo would appreciate the most, however, were the living monuments he'd set free. 22 men who got to go home. Part 3. When Wildlife Needs Fire to Flourish Fire is not just a reseeding tool or a strategy that birds use to capture prey. Species such as mule deer rely on fires to wipe out older vegetation and make room for the newer growth that deer typically dine on. The areas of new growth that sprout after wildfire help the deer to build their fat stores and increase their chances of winter survival as well as giving those bucks a chance to grow their antlers at a faster pace. Black-backed woodpeckers select fire-ravaged trees to build their nests and roosts, creating a home for themselves and for their chicks. When they leave their roosts for good, the cavity becomes a useful habitat for other species. A far less likely animal has also learned how to take the aftermath of destruction 
and turn it into an opportunity to flourish. You'll recognize this animal by his welcoming smile and charming southern flair stamped on the windows, billboards, and buckets of over 25,000 restaurant franchises worldwide. Colonel Sanders. Some fun facts about Colonel Sanders? Yes, he is a legitimate colonel. That snowy white goatee of his, he bleached it to match his hair. The first KFC franchise actually opened in Salt Lake City, Utah. After he sold KFC and observed the recipe changes to reduce the cost of the food prep, he became critical of the quality, comparing the gravy to sludge and wallpaper paste. The Colonel's legendary chicken has spread to all corners of the earth, including Japan, where a legend called Curse of the Colonel spread when one of his statues was thrown in a river by celebrating baseball fans. But before the worldwide fame, 25,000 franchises, or even the white goatee, the Colonel was a hungry little boy, fatherless and destitute. When he was born in Indiana in 1890, he would go by Harland rather than Colonel. His father was described as affectionate and hardworking, with a devout Christian mother that frequently cautioned her children of the evils of alcohol, tobacco, gambling, and whistling on Sundays. But at five years old, the tender young Harland would learn the pain of loss. His father, the family's breadwinner, passed away, forcing his mother to leave Harland and his two younger siblings behind while she toiled at a tomato cannery. Young Harland was in charge of tending to the children, who had to forage for meals. According to the New Yorker, this meant that little Harland had to look after his younger sister and brother and do much of the family cooking. He had already been picking up cooking pointers from his mother, just out of curiosity. By the time he was seven, he was excelling in bread and vegetables and coming along nicely in meat. Mom was away for days at a time, leaving the kids to forage in the fields for sassafras buds and May apples by day, and to go to bed when they pleased at night. We didn't have any babysitter, but we got along fine, the colonel says. We knowed enough not to burn the house down. Just like forest after wildfire, little Harlan's life had been deconstructed. He experienced one of the greatest tragedies a young boy can, the loss of his father. But somehow, even as a near orphan with little food, the growth of a new life was beginning to take hold. Without a mother to stay with him at home, the future Colonel Sanders, king of fried chicken, was learning to cook. Perhaps it was this early introduction to food, how to make it and how to crave it, that set Harlan Sanders up to become the second biggest restaurant franchise in history. And maybe it was this dogged, thick-skinned lifestyle that would prepare him to face the obstacles to come. After his mother remarried and Harland found himself in a tempestuous relationship with his new stepfather, he left home at the age of 13. As the boy aged, he never stopped working. He evolved from babysitter and cook to farmhand and horse carriage painter. From there, he'd become a streetcar conductor. He'd lie about his age and be sent to Cuba at the age of 16 as an enlisted army man. He'd go on to work as a blacksmith's assistant, a railroad employee, a fireman, and more, before getting a degree in law and creating a practice in Little Rock. His law business came to an abrupt end, however, when he got in a brawl with his own client in the middle of a court proceeding. Quote, Sanders had encountered repeated failure, largely through bullheadedness, a lack of self-control, impatience, and a self-righteous lack of diplomacy. Unquote. That was his biographer. Perhaps it was because of his father's death or the absence of his mother when Harland was young. Maybe it was his unwelcoming stepfather, or his inability to find a career where he belonged. Either way, Harland Sanders seemed to be smoldering from the misfortunes that had befallen him. These irreverent little fires inside him were about to be put to good use. When Harland was 35, Shell Oil Company offered him a service station in Kentucky, rent-free, provided that Shell was given a portion of the sales. It was here that the future colonel would blithely stumble into his calling and begin to sell his first batches of his legendary Kentucky Fried Chicken. It was also here that the man's fiery nature would be put to the test. To promote his new gas station, 
Harlan placed signs throughout the town, directing potential customers to Shell. But he wasn't alone in his fuel station ambition. There was a competitor in town by the name of Matt Stewart. Mr. Stewart had a, this town ain't big enough for the two of us type attitude, and the kind of ambition that led to a heavy trigger finger. He took to painting over Harlan's signs, redirecting traffic to his own gas station. When Harlan caught him in the act, he threatened to blow his goddamn head off. Matt Stewart must not have detected that decades-old forest fire that had been churning in Harlan Sanders since his father died. He must not have noticed the tough new growth that had taken root in the man's spirit, the kind of growth that toughened him with each passing hardship, like brambles curling through his body. Had he seen it within Sanders, he may not have kept painting over the signs. However, in a meeting with two of his managers, Harland received word that his competitor was at it again, sloshing over his signs with propaganda for the other gas station. Harland and his two managers rushed to the scene of the crime, one of the managers toting a firearm. Stewart had prepared for this. Once he saw the trio coming, he scuttled down his paint ladder, cocked his own gun, and fired. His bullet found its target. The manager that had brought his own weapon died on impact, collapsing to the ground. Harland quickly retrieved his fallen boss's gun and returned fire on Stewart. An exchange of bullets tore through the air until Stewart cried out, Don't shoot, Sanders! You've killed me! His exclamation turned out to be an exaggeration. While Sanders did finally hit Stewart in the shoulder, the man survived. Matt Stewart was sent to prison for 18 years for murdering the shell manager. Sanders, having acted in self-defense, was free to resume his business without a single competitor in town. The signs, in a sad, morbid kind of way, proved more effective in growing his business than he ever could have dreamed. Brambles weren't the only things that had grown in Sanders since the fires of his youth. From those early days as the steward of his siblings, the ability to cook had also flourished within him. Harlan Sanders continued to sell his Kentucky Fried Chicken at the Shell Station, and was soon discovered by food critic Duncan Hines, who published this humble entry. A very good place to stop and route to Cumberland Falls and the Great Smokies. Continuous 24-hour service. Sizzling steaks, fried chicken, country ham, hot biscuits. If it weren't for Harlan Sanders' early wildfires, from his childhood cooking to his early expulsion from home, it's likely he never would have found himself as the first heir to the fried chicken throne. After the food critic's visit, Sanders expanded his business and would eventually sell the company for $16.7 million of today's dollars. Nowadays, KFC's annual revenue tops at $23 billion. It seemed that Colonel Sanders kept much of his fiery spark as he aged. The New Yorker even commented on the force and variety of his swearing. However, as the man grew old, he had more to offer the world than just chicken and spark. He used his fortune to start a charity, as well as give sizable donations to various children's hospitals. He passed away from acute leukemia in Louisville, Kentucky, and his body lays in the rotunda at the Kentucky State Capitol. Like the mule deer and woodpeckers of the West, who forage and nest in the wake of forest fires, Colonel Sanders of the South took his personal natural disasters and turn them into something to eat. That is the end of today's stories. Now we invite you to join us for our weekly Silver Liners Challenge, which is designed to be an easy, actionable step that you can take to help boost your week and help you survive hell. Here it is, the Silver Liners Challenge. Try this thought exercise. What parts of your life would you consider dismantled and destroyed, as if a wildfire had passed through? How did this wildfire prepare you to flourish in an unexpected way? Feel free to share your experiences in the comments of our website, www.survivorsguidetohell.com, or on our Facebook page. If you'd like to see the videos and pictures that often accompany our episodes, once again, check out our website, where you'll also find much more information, including our storytelling code of ethics. We're always looking for cool news stories. If you have something to share, please visit our site and drop us a line. 
And remember, if you like this episode, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, and other streaming platforms. When you subscribe, you no longer have to go searching for episodes. They'll be delivered right to the place you listen to your podcasts. Simply open the app or website you use, find our podcast, and click the subscribe button. You'll also be helping to support us as we spread our good vibes. If you like Survivor's Guide to Hell and would like to contribute some fuel for our fire, then you're already on the right track. Just listening is the best thing you can do. We've also seen amazing results when our listeners share our episodes with others. If this episode made you think of someone, send it their way. They may be grateful for it, and we will be too. Last but not least, our cheesy joke of the week. A man goes to see the Pope. Your Holiness, I work for KFC and will offer you $10 million to change the reading of the Lord's Prayer from give us this day our daily bread to give us this day our daily chicken. The Pope is aghast. I can't just go changing God's word for money. The man comes back the next day. 50 million. Now think of all the good the church could do with all that money, Your Holiness. The Pope is unimpressed. Look, I told you, I just can't do it. I'm sorry. The guy is back a week later. Final offer, $500 million. Take it or leave it. The next day, the Pope calls all the leaders of the church together. Boys, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is we've raised $500 million for Catholic charities. And now for the bad news. We lost the Wonder Bread account. <laughs>